Start. Welcome everyone. This is um, the seventh in our lecture series already. Um, and our speaker today is Dr. Christian Noack, whom you otherwise know as the organizer of the series. And aside from being that, Christian is also associate professor here at the UFA, specializing in East European studies. Um, his main area of expertise is Russia and Ukraine. Um, he's worked extensively on the politics of memory, in particular in relation to Ukraine. He's, he's done one a book on the Holodomor and the memory of that. Um, his most recent uh, publication, however, is uh, very closely connected to the topic of today's lecture, which is the politics of language in the near abroad and the far abroad. Um, the Russian language, of course, and um, today he's going to speak about um, language politics in Ukraine. Thank you, um, Eva, for the introduction. And it's really a pleasure to swap the roles this time and um, have the opportunity to share uh, some of what I consider my insights in the field uh, of language studies and uh, language legislation uh, in Ukraine. Um, I want to start with um, a short section in which I try to uh, explain why I do think that this topic is perhaps of more interest uh, to political scientists, to historians, than other linguistic um, topics and subjects. What you see very often, and actually we had that also in our first lecture here, is uh, the juxtaposition of these two maps. And this is quite suggestive, right? You have on the left uh, the results of the third round of the um, presidential elections of 2004-05, the context of the Orange Revolution, and you see that in Western and um, Central Ukraine, uh, a large majority of the electorate voted for Viktor Yushchenko, and you have the South and the East voting still um, in the majority for Viktor Yanukovych. And on the right side, you see the share of Russian speakers um, around the same time, um, based on a census of 2001, uh, in the different parts of Ukraine. And there seems to be a very um, clear analogy um, if you look at the territories with very few Russian speakers and the orientation towards Yushchenko and generally, as it is suggested, a more pro-Western orientation and the more pro-Russian orientation in the South and the East, exactly um, where Yanukovych was collecting his um, votes. I do think this is um, a dangerous analogy because it simplifies a lot of much more complex matters. So um, what I suggest here today is um, the thesis first that this linguistic split in terms of content and methods is quite um, problematic. And that has to do um, not at least with the fact how censuses and surveys um, count actually the linguistic capacities of Ukrainians. Um, I secondly will then go on and discuss the links between language and the identity in the Ukrainian case. And here my thesis is clearly that this link is much weaker than many um, observers believe, but particularly um, how Russia interprets actually the existence of uh, larger numbers of Russian speakers in the Ukraine. There is uh, very often in the Russian rhetoric uh, a shortcut between Russian speaker and Russians. Um, the third thesis that I suggest tonight is that there is a late but conscious politicization of the language question, um, um, something that a colleague of mine has even um, described as a weaponization of the uh, language question. And that happened mainly in the second decade of the 21st century. 
And finally, and that's perhaps the, less, the least surprising thesis, is that uh, since the Russian aggressions of 2014 and 2022, um, this is a lost case for Russia, um, stepping up as um, the guardian of the Russian speakers and claiming that there is no such thing that, uh, like an independent Ukrainian um, language, right? Um, just to um, give you one of the examples of these kind of simplifying quotes, uh, this is from a, a Ukrainian uh, linguistic portal um, by um, a scholar named Osnach, and um, he or she, I don't even know whether it's, it's a female scholar, um, said the language question was one of the main causes of the conflict that erupted in the eastern part of the country. And I do think this statement is as problematic as claiming that the wars on the Balkans were caused by religious contrasts, right? It's the same type of kind of shortcut uh, that I want to engage with tonight. Um, if, I, as I, I, I'm not going to deliver here a kind of linguistic uh, lecture. This is not my aim. I'm a trained historian. I'm interested in language uh, issues, but um, I'll keep the kind of linguistic side and the, the history of the languages um, uh, quite compact here. What you needed to know is that among the Slavic languages, there are three larger subgroups, and um, the Eastern Slavic subgroup is usually held to consist of the Russian language, the Belarusian, and the Ukrainian language. Um, one of the ideas is that in some historical past, um, these groups were speaking the same language and that this kind of division happened in historical times. Uh, as with all uh, historical linguistics, there ought to be um, a grain of salt uh, in these claims because very often these are reconstructions for many of the claimed stages of that development, we don't, do not have any written, um, not to mention oral um, testimonies, right? So um, I do not think it's, it's, it's also leading us very far here to discuss whether there is indeed in medieval Rus still one language. Um, but this is important to know that this claim exists because it feeds into a Russian historical narrative, which is quite widespread and um, still uh, very much at the basis of the, the, the modern Russian understanding that um, Kiev and the Kievan medieval state is at the roots of the Russian state, that there is a continuous development. Uh, this claim is backed up with the history of the baptism of the Rus and a kind of continuous um, development of the churches, particularly after the uh, Mongol invasion with the relocation of the Patriarch um, first and, or the Metropolitan, uh, first to Vladimir and later to Moscow. Um, and um, obviously with the emergence of a uh, Ukrainian national movement, the Ukrainians um, began to discuss actually this thesis either saying, yeah, there was a continuous development, but it didn't lead to Moscow, but uh, it remained in our area and led to the creation of modern Ukraine, or um, disputing that there was a lot of con continuity and communality uh, already in this medieval period. The second fact that is very important to understand about the language development in the Eastern Slavic realm is the fact that um, a lot of written sources were written in church Slavonic, which is derived from Southern Slavic languages, Bulgarian basically, and thus brought um, a, a history of parallel terms into, for example, the Russian language, but also the other Eastern Slavic languages. Um, you very often have a more abstract terms um, in a, um, um, in a variation that is based on the church Slavonic um, and a more vernacular um, term for um, more vernacular things. Um, uh, one example that comes to my head is actually the word for head, which is in Russian Golova, and the equivalent from um, Southern Slavic is Glava, which means chapter. You have that in several languages, these kind of parallels. Uh, but this, this gives you an idea. Uh, let's jump to the more recent developments. 
What you see actually is this long uh, written tradition um, of Church Slavonic, which is the liturgic language of orthodoxy. Um, you have then uh, in the wake of Peter's reforms, uh, secularization, codification of um, a secular Russian language, uh, which is then developed into modern Russian literary language, uh, particularly uh, with Pushkin seen as a kind of creator and turning point in that development since the 1830s. Now, this is important um, in so far as um, we have different um, linguistic traditions in uh, Ukrainian territories. We have a uh, state-like formation, the so-called Hetmanate in the Cossack areas of what is nowadays rather southeastern Ukraine with its own uh, uh, cancellary um, language and, 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 and sources which actually partly serve as the basis for the development of a literary Ukrainian language um, in the 1840s, where another poet, Taras Shevchenko, is seen uh, in a kind of analogy to, to Pushkin as the founding fathers. And we have outside the realm of the Russian Empire um, in the Western areas of Ukraine, also a development of another Ukrainian language, which is usually called Ruthenian or Rusin. Um, and um, this um, developed since the Reformation period. Uh, indeed, the, the development of the languages um, in the West um, of the Eastern Slavic realm were very much um, accelerated by the fact that these territories were, were closer to the areas where we see the religious wars and conflicts of Reformation and Counter-Reformation. Um, I can't go into the details here, but what is of interest is that um, the modernizing Russian Empire in the 19th century looked for a kind of new identity narrative. And um, some of the, uh, again, uh, milestones on this way would be, for example, the 1840s when Count Uvarov uh, um, created the famous triad of autocracy, orthodoxy, and nationality. And um, obviously, under the influence of uh, pan-European developments like Romanticism, um, the question of languages became an identity-related um, object in the thinking of imperial elites. Now, autocracy meant the, uh, the, the, the rule of the Tsarist, that was not to be discussed. Orthodoxy meant one orthodoxy and one orthodoxy under um, the um, leadership of the the, the, the Russian Orthodox Church, therefore, attempts to introduce other vernacular languages in the West, for example, in, in um, Ukrainian territories, in Sunday schools, um, were seen very critically. And uh, it was actually um, to prevent the split of orthodoxy rather than already fight a kind of national movement that uh, in the 1860s, the so-called um, Valuev circular um, um, prohibited the print of certain types of literature uh, in uh, Ukrainian language. So um, the idea of keeping that triad alive is important. The problem of nationality and language is obviously that, um, if I simplify it a bit, um, the Russian language was stolen from the Russian and was taken as a kind of overarching model of culture for the whole imperial society, um, whereas um, the um, inclusion into that um, Russian culture was uh, increasingly um, creating resistance by um, the Ukrainian intelligentsia, which um, saw itself as a distinct or clearly distinct branch of um, this larger Russian nation, right? And um, the idea was that therefore um, there were at least two Russian languages, the, the smaller Russian, little Russian, or what we call Ukrainian and the greater Russian. But the greater Russian language since this time is either sort of treated as um, the, um, a quality of the ethnic group of Russians, but also as a quality or as a joint culture of 
several Eastern Slavic nations, right? <clears throat> and uh, we see um, this kind of banning of uh, the Ukrainian language in order to preserve this kind of triad of autocracy, orthodoxy, and nationality intensify um, in the last uh, third, roughly speaking, of the, the 19th century. Um, and in 1876, while staying in the German spa of Bad Ems, uh, Tsar Alexander II banned uh, further um, uh, genres of literature to be printed uh, in Ukrainian here. Um, Ukrainian was already treated as sort of an or invention of the Poles who had just um, um, staged an uprising against Russian rule which uh, was successfully suppressed by uh, the empire, but um, Ukrainian is um, dealt in as a kind of, yeah, artificially blown up cultural phenomenon. Uh, and uh, the, uh, those of you who have read um, Vladimir Putin's essays on Russian-Ukrainian uh, relations know this argument, so it's nothing new. I skipped for time reasons, the, the next slide, which kind of goes into some of the details here of the development, but suffice to say for our kind of argument here that by um, the end of the empire, there was a sufficient, sufficiently developed Ukrainian uh, literary language. And that was partly due to the fact that even in the territories outside the Russian empire, the language of Shevchenko was increasingly accepted uh, by the Galician Ukrainians as well, so that indeed the use of that new literary Ukrainian language bridged um, the Austrian then empire and the Russian empire and the Ukrainians living in it. Um, <clears throat> let me jump to Soviet Ukraine, and here we have um, um, the interesting fact, we had this lecture by my colleague Professor Hausmann about the abortive uh, attempts to create Ukrainian states, after the revolution, uh, when the Soviets actually took over and created Soviet Ukraine as one of the Soviet republics, it meant that there was a um, at least semi-recognition of statehood, but the nation building process that the Soviets uh, featured, particularly during the 20s, was rather um, concentrated on a kind of cultural nation building project. So, um, um, it is interesting to note, for example, that the decision to make Ukraine um, a union republic, and uh, yes, in, in, indeed, the, the, the idea of create, creating a, a, a union state was subject of a debate between Lenin and Stalin in the early 1920s. And Stalin had the idea to, to create um, an autonomy within the Russian Socialist Federative Republic and Lenin insisted on giving the Ukrainians more of a status in a um, Soviet Republic. In the 1920s, we see a cultural Ukrainization uh, policy, uh, affirmative action, as Terry Martin has, uh, has called that, with um, the development of a comprehensive school system in Ukrainian, with the aim of creating um, indigenous cadres for the Soviet state, the Soviet e economy, and so on and so forth. In the 1930s, Moscow, the Soviet leadership turns against Ukraine. We have in the course of the um, industrialization and um, collectivization policies, um, the quite deliberate acceptance of a famine in several parts of the Soviet Union, in Kazakhstan, but most famously and probably most heavily uh, in uh, Eastern Ukraine. And we have uh, in the 1930s, the Stalinist terror turning against actually those Ukrainian language elites that the state had bred itself in the 1920s. Uh, in, uh, during the Second World War, as uh, is well known, um, Ukraine is basically battlefield and um, uh, um, subdued to German occupation regimes. Um, immediately before the German attack and after uh, the defeat of the Germans, uh, the Soviets annexed those territories of Western Ukraine who had belonged to Poland or Romania uh, or Czechoslovakia. 
in the interwar period. So since the, uh, since the end of the Second World War, we have uh, the current borders uh, of Ukraine on the mainland. Um, famously, Crimea was added to the Ukraine Soviet Republic only in 1954. Um, and we have a policy um, in the 50s, 60s and 70s, which actually aimed at the creation of a united Soviet people in which the cultural differences um, between um, the peoples of the Soviet Union were suge suggested to become less and less important, a merger. And actually the Soviet people, and here's a parallel again to the imperial politics, was culturally defined by Russian culture, Russian history, and the Russian language. So Russian became the language of intercommunal or inter-ethnic communication uh, in the Soviet Union after the World War. P many people de deliberately um, rather sent their children to Russian language schools in order to see to it that they got the, what was seen, the better education, more chances for social ascent, right? More mobility across the Soviet territory. And um, when we look at the end of the Soviet period, we have something which is typical for um, much of the Soviet territory um, in total, but in particular for the Slavic republics of Belarus and Ukraine, uh, what I call here asymmetrical bilingualism, which means that <clears throat> the um, members of the titular nation, in this case, the Ukrainians, were almost all bilingual. They knew Ukrainian to some different degree, not all of them, but many of them, and all of them knew Russian. Whereas Russians living in the Soviet republics, be it Belarus or Ukraine or elsewhere, um, very rarely learned the uh, local languages, right? Therefore, this bilingualism is not symmetric, but asymmetric. And I have a nice quote here from the actually very conservative Ukrainian party leader, Volodymyr Shevitsky from 1974, where he says, today as never before, the role and the significance of the Russian language during the process of cultural development is growing. It is by law the second mother tongue in our Republic and has become the generally recognized means of communication between all the nations and the peoples of the USSR. And I sort of highlighted here the, the term second mother tongue, because that's an interesting concept in itself. I don't know how many people run around with two tongues in their, in their mouth. And if so, then uh, this is not necessarily seen as something very positive by the people they encounter. But I'll return to this question of the second mother tongue in a minute. So this is um, statistics about the ling ling linguistical situation at the end of the Soviet period. So uh, on the left, you have um, the nationalities and on the, on, on the right, um, the native languages taken by the last published Ukrainian census. And what is important to see is the difference between the numbers of people who think of themselves being Ukrainians and those speaking Ukrainian, although the difference is not very massive here, and between Russians, people who think of themselves as Russians and people um, who um, speak Russian as a native language, right? So the, 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 the language knowledge of Russian is higher than the actual percentage of ethnic Russians. This is the main kind of message that you can take out there. The second thing was, that's why I made this table longer, is that um, these two languages and these two nationalities actually dominate the scene, right? All the other linguistic minorities um, are very, very small. That has to do um, with um, deliberate historical decisions by the Germans to kill uh, the Jewish population. Otherwise, we would probably have Yiddish as a significant language here as well. And the population exchanges between Poland and Ukraine after the Second World War, which led and, and to really reduce the number of Poles, which were much more significant in Ukraine, uh, to a very small minority and vice versa with Ukrainians settled out of Polish territories. And the last thing that you can see here, because there's 12 years between the dates, is that the, the number of Crimean Tatars at, well, 
at the peak of perestroika, if I may say so, was still very small because by then they were still prohibited to return to Crimea, whereas in 2001, uh, it had grown significantly and is one of the larger minority groups here. Um, what does that all mean? Um, and this is a kind of attempt to summarize the very complex linguistic situation in Ukraine. Um, we have um, a majority of the Ukrainians who claim across the years with a growing percentage to communicate freely in Ukrainian, to master Ukrainian. But um, their share rises and the share of those who claim Russian their mother, mother tongue it is diminishing also as a long drawn out process that started long before 2014. But at the same time, we know from surveys like a 2015 survey, which I uh, quote here, that of these people, these 60% say that uh, freely communicate in Ukrainian, not all of them use it actually in daily life at home or in public. Um, so, the number of Ukrainians declaring themselves Russian speakers is consistently higher than those declaring themselves Russians, and their share decreases over time. Uh, the only exception for that um, observation would be Crimea, in which um, indeed more than 80% of um, the people speaking Russian also claim to be Russian. Um, the share in, even in the Donbass is much lower. <clears throat> what we have is still this continued existence of what I called asymmetrical um, bilingualism. That is, there's a way better understanding of Russian by those who speak Ukrainian than the other way around. So many Russian speakers don't see still the point of learning Ukrainian or their sort of um, capacity of speaking Ukrainian is quite limited. <clears throat> and actually that gave at the end of the Soviet period um, um, birth to a kind of mixed language, which is now also on the retreat, which was known as Surzhik, which had combined sort of uh, elements of Russian and Ukrainian. Uh, what is still important to note is the use of Russian as a lingua franca among minority groups. When I was as an election observer at the presidential elections in Ukraine in 1999, I was uh, in some villages on the border with Romania where the people actually were Romanian speaking, but used Russian as the language um, in daily life. And when they encountered the state, unfortunately, already then there was a law that stipulated that the election reports that the election committee locally had to fill in had to be in Ukrainian. And we as OSCE observers had a translator who did the translation work for the election committee locally, right? Just as an illustration. Um, but um, we need to be quite cautious to interpret all these kind of survey and census data, because actually there is, um, first of all, a bias in the way you ask about linguistic capacities, right? What is the mother tongue? Is that sort of literally the, the language your mother spoke or that was spoken at home? Or perhaps your mother spoke and your father didn't speak and you spoke Russian at home? Or what is native language, right? Sort of there is a, a variety of understandings and a variety of uses and formulations in surveys and censuses that kind of bias what is entered there, particularly in the situation of bi or mid multilingualism, right? So the, the, the census and the survey wants a clear answer. The situation is unclear, right? So it simplifies actually compli complicated facts of life. Um, then I already quoted this idea of two mother tongues, right? And um, actually there is a whole kind of discussion among observers whether um, this two mother tongues idea is actually um, indicative not of um, a kind of Russian identity of those speakers, but rather a Soviet identity because it dates back from, to the idea of creating this merged Soviet people. Now oh, it's this, no, cancel. Yeah. Um, and um, so here, um, again, the question of the link between language and identity, ethnicity is quite complex. 
Um, another story which, um, to which I turn now when I look at um, language legislation is the question, what do politicians, what role do politicians ascribe to certain languages? Uh, in the Soviet time, Ukraine was clearly a kind of language that had a lower social status than Russia for several reasons that I sketched. Um, and obviously since 1989, as we will see, there is an attempt by the um, political elite in Ukraine to redeem this and give the language a higher status. But as one of the observers correctly um, remarked, this is a zero sum game, right? So if, if you raise the status of the Ukraine, you take it away from the Russian language. It's almost inevitable. So here we come into a much sort of more simple relationship or even linear relationship between the languages, which again is not very typical for the very complex uh, multi or at least bilingual situation in the country. Think about that. So, I mean, it is a political dispute, but again, it simplifies with the focus on the social status of languages that, that many, many, many people in Ukraine know both languages and can use both languages more or less freely. The problem that remained throughout much of the period that I'm describing now is that the Russian language was not just used in sources and media that were locally produced, but gave access to a broader information field in which Russian was clearly dominant. And until very recently, the use of uh, Facebook or um, um, other things like um, Wikipedia, um, many Ukrainians tend to use more Russian language um, Wikipedia, also because there are more entries, right? So in that sense, there's also a kind of pragmatic side of the ling linguistic dominance of, of Russian. But let's look at the development of the legal status of the languages. So uh, already at the peak of Perestroika in 1989, the still quite conservative party leadership of Ukraine um, passed a law on languages in which Ukrainian was uh, declared as the state language as a kind of, you know, development towards upgrading the status of the language, but not with much consequences. Um, the historical background for that was rather that on the, um, with, with the liberalization of perestroika, um, many intellectuals looking at the history um, of Ukraine were getting increasingly nervous about the status of the Ukrainian language and put up um, organizations that, 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 that laid claims on the government not doing enough for Ukrainian. So it was a kind of symbolic act with not yet much consequences. The same could be basically said about the 1996 constitution in which, um, again, Ukrainian is called the state language of Ukraine um, and that the state ensures comprehensive development in all spheres of social life through the entire territory. Well, at the time, not much policies to implement these claims followed. Um, things obviously started to change and get into flux with the Orange Revolution and um, the Yushchenko period. But even there, um, there, was a, there were attempts at drafting a new state concept of language policy. But um, on the Yushchenko, the focus was much stronger on history and memory um, for example, the campaign of 2009 to find international recognition for the Holodomor as a genocide and these things, right? So language policies, in a sense, um, always trail back. Although, as I said, there was this clear um, aspiration to raise the status of Ukraine, but it, it remained declarative. And in a sense, we have a situation in which a, a, a large centrist block, at least in the polit political elite says it's enough to serve or to have lip service paid to uh, the status of Ukrainian and not kind of shake up things too wildly. And there were small minorities on the one hand, these were the um, Ukrainophones who, who claimed we must um, see to it that actually Ukrainian becomes the dominant language. And there was on the other extreme, there were Russian speakers that said we must actually give a constitutional status to Russian as well. Right? But in practice, sort of everything was 
going through the Vulcan middle of the road. Although, as you see in the lower picture, then uh, particularly in Eastern Ukraine, when, the, when there were more Ukrainian new schools um, uh, um, or opened, then the parents were protesting against it with slogans like uh, hands off of the Russian language. But nothing dramatically really happened. This changed only, as I said, in the second decade and with the election actually of Yanukovych as a president. He very quickly kind of um, realized that by giving Russian some sort of legal status, he could endear himself by part of his electorate, which indeed, as we have seen, was based in the south and the east of Ukraine, and obviously also do Russian politically a favor, which might pay off in bribes, uh, cheap gas, and what have you. So <clears throat> on the Yanukovych, uh, within two years, um, the Kivalov Kolesnichenko law on the principle of state language policy in Ukraine was drafted and passed in the Rada. It's now interesting perhaps to know that Kivalov was the head of the election commission that falsified the 2004 elections. So he was uh, quite known uh, friend uh, of uh, Yanukovych. And Kolesnichenko was actually the head of the Russian language society of Ukraine. So they were cert certainly not uh, very sort of um, balanced uh, in their approach to language questions. But they were clever enough to borrow the vocabulary of that law from the European Charter for Regional and Minority Languages. But actually, the way they stipulated the law actually meant that they took away um, the incentive for Russians, if there ever had been any, to learn Ukrainian. Because in Russian uh, language areas, Russian could be declared to be a regional language, and then all the stipulations that would have enforced people to use Ukrainian were nullified, right, where, where this status existed. And um, what, what is another typical thing for Ukrainian parliaments at the time, um, and during the debates of um, these laws, um, usually uh, wild uh, brawls um, happened. I took that as a still from a video who's interested uh, can find that on the internet. And indeed, the, 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 the perhaps, um, let me rephrase the sentence, go back to one, gear one down. Um, when I discussed this law with students in uh, my courses, they initially do not see what the problem is because the law stipulates a kind of minority and regional status, a kind of protection for the use of Russian. But only against the context of what we just discussed, the li linguistic situation, it really comes out that um, the problem of the law is by securing a minority status, it takes away uh, the incentives of uh, learning the state language. And uh, Knut Vollebeck, who is then the OSCE, OSCE High Commissioner on National Minorities, he and the Hague observed that very clearly, as you can see in the quote. So I have very few minutes left, so um, I should bring you now to the current legislation, but I have one more intermediate step here. And that is obviously what happened after the Maidan, because then that made actually headlines. Um, two days after um, Yanukovych had fled, the still same parliament, which had uh, shortly before voted for his um, extra uh, parliamentary rights, um, decided uh, to revoke the 2012 law. But the interim president then, uh, Turchinov, refused to sign that, knowing that this was creating trouble. And indeed, the reaction of Russia um, at the moment, and also of the international community, um, was um, this is not very wise to do, particularly in this situation of turmoil. Um, the problem is that Russia since then claims that um, actually there's no no protection of Russian speakers. Uh, ironically, the law was in power until 2018. Only then the Constitutional Court uh, revoked the law. But um, what happened in the, in the interim period was typically, um, a, or I would describe it as a continuation of the politics that we've seen before, right? So if we, we change things, we do things symbolically, but we're not very hard on implementation. I mean, obviously Ukraine had other more burning problems than 
uh, the language law. What we see um, is a certain restriction of the Russian language material in uh, the media, which is quite understandable if you know how kind of, um, yeah, how polarized actually um, the opinions had become after 2014. Um, and um, even the 2017 law on education, uh, which had to regulate of the use of languages in schools, um, did not create uh, a, a lot of turmoil um, in the Russian language areas. <laughs> Interestingly, it, it um, brought protests from Hungary and Romania because um, these, uh, although you've seen how small these kind of uh, groups in, uh, are in, in Ukraine, they have already profited from quite ambitious schooling projects that were funded by Romania and Hungary. So uh, they protested this law and um, a um, very good way out for, um, for Ukraine was found by saying that several subjects can be taught in languages that are official languages of the EU. So we sidelined Russian and brought back in uh, Hungarian and Romanian. Now, what is the legal situation now? I really have to <coughs> wrap up here. Um, and I'm here um, quote extensively on this slide from this uh, 2019 law, which was part of the if I may say so, election campaign of Poroshenko, who wanted to be re-elected and who took a more nationalist stance, right? Sort of tried to satisfy the more pro-Ukrainian pro um, constituencies in the country, whereas, um, which is almost bitter irony, um, the, the, the current president was elected on a promise to sort of um, improve the relationship between Ukraine and Russia. But there you go. So here you see clearly um, that is just one state language in the law, that it is linked to the idea of state building of a unitary state, um, that uh, the state is, is really the only state language, um, that even sort of poking fun at Ukrainian in documents um, is, um, um, is, is threatened by law enforcement, uh, the, in, in, in um, the public sphere, in the governments, in the courts, the use is mandatory um, and uh, Ukrainian is here consciously defined in the function that Russia had before, namely as the language of inter-ethnic communication. And it is a clearly here a kind of separation between all spheres of public life and private life and religious life in which uh, exceptions are acceptable, which is a kind of goal with, before the practice is actually how people use languages. But uh, there are um, some 30 articles clearly explaining what all the spheres of public life are in which uh, Ukrainian has to be used. And um, kind of the bridge building is done in the articles 5, uh, 6 and 7, um, which uh, announces language programs for those who want to learn it. Um, and um, kind of link also the language question to um, citizenship, something we've seen in the Baltics in the 90s, for example, already. So, um, and if you were thinking of acquiring Ukrainian citizenship, uh, you better start learning the language now as well. So, to sum up, um, we have certain problems uh, describing the language use. Um, because either the concepts are not very clearly distinguishing what we're actually talking about. The language identity link, the link has been quite um, weak due to the widespread but asymmetrical bilingualism. So the supporters of a united Ukrainian state and Ukrainization consist of Ukrainian speakers, Russian speakers and bilinguals. Whereas um, those um, separatists basically um, draw on constituencies of um, monolingual Russian speakers. The effect of the politicization or weaponization, um, as Rezanova Clark has called it, of the Russian language means that um, not only um, indeed um, Ukrainian qua, uh, qua status is on the rise, but Russian is um, increasingly seen as the language of the aggressor and no longer as the kind of neutral code in the background. Um, the language legislation brought an implement implementation of language laws that um, was slow and 
pragmatic rather. Um, the bigger issues were um, actually until 2010 only in quarrels with Crimea, where, as I said, the population identifies also as ethnic Russian. Um, we've seen the increasing politicization in 2010, and um, unfortunately, I can't go here into many details, but we've seen that there were both internal and external actors that were interested in it. Um, but the slow kind of implementation of language uh, laws continued even after the Maidan revolution until 2019, and only the last and new language law clearly monopolizes the use of Ukrainian in public life. That's it. Thank you. so much christian for this uh, whirlwind history of um, ukrainian language policies and also um, the presence of russian language in ukraine um, we already have two questions uh, in the q a but perhaps if i could suggest we start with questions from the room and then we'll move on to to those questions from people people online so do we have any questions there is one question there and if there is any other one, please raise your hand. Okay, one, one more here. Very good. Thank you very much uh, for that. And I have a question about, you, you mentioned a hybrid language, the Russian and Ukrainian. I'm curious about how widespread it was and where it was spoken. Well, <laughs> it, it, it was very widespread in, uh, in central Ukraine. Um, it was very widespread among the old political elite, the outgoing communist elite. I remember working for a foundation um, in the 1990s and bringing uh, then Ukrainian journalists, politicians, members of the elite to Germany. And I was surprised how well I could understand the Ukrainian. Well, actually, the explanation isn't probably Ukrainian, right? So, but um, obviously with this polarization, um, this, this, this mixed, code is losing ground very clearly. It's called Sorosik. If you're interested, you'll find literature about it. Uh, yeah, I was wondering uh, something similar. Like in central Ukraine, is there like a continuum between Ukrainian and Russian, or is there a clear separation between the two? No, as I said, sort of, I mean, this is the, the problem that this, this kind of pitting of the languages against each other in the political discourse suggests that people that are Ukrainian speakers are sort of Ukrainian nationalists and those who speak Russian are Russian nationalists. But as I quoted some surveys, um, we very often have the situation that somebody speaks Russian in public life, goes home and speaks Ukrainian with their kids or the other way around. So, um, and this is, <clears throat> this is, perhaps very characteristic for larger parts of Ukraine, except perhaps the extreme West and the extreme East. Yeah. So bilingualism is actually what is, what is or has until now been the rule, um, as I said, with the um, psychological impact of aggression and war, uh, it is very well uh, thinkable that um, Russian the knowledge of Russian will decrease over the next generation and will next come down. Yeah. And there is another question from Paul. Hey, um, the slide is gone, but on your last slide, you said that the Russia backed separatists are, as a rule, monolingual Russian speaks. And because you also talked about how difficult it is to know these things, can you explain how you know that this is a rule? Well, this is um, not my own research. I haven't been doing interviews in the Donbass, uh, but other scholars have done as far as that, that was still possible. And we simply know that indeed um, there, was, is, there were surveys done in which uh, people were asked to, use, to sort of support the um, independence of the Donbass. And then this was linked to data about their kind of linguistic capacities. Don't forget, I mean, sort of the, the, the other things is more easily forgotten. I don't find that very surprising, right? But uh, do not forget that in, in, in towns like Donetsk, Luhansk, uh, there were lots of people left who were Ukrainian speaking, who for one or the other reasons couldn't get out or didn't want to get out or didn't want to leave their, their, their homes, right? And they are also still there, right? There is one question here as well. 
Shall we take in the meantime one uh, question? Perhaps? Yes, there is a question which is more um, historically oriented. It's, it's a question for a historical linguist, really. It's about the role of the glagolitic language in the whole development of, uh, of Slavonic languages. And the person was wondering also whether you could compare this uh, development to what we see in Belgium, for example, the difference between Dutch and Flemish. Okay, I start with the second part of the question because I find that easier to answer. I do think that indeed, um, what we have seen historically in Flanders was bilingualism, right? Particularly among the elites who were both French and Flemish speaking in the 19th century and a kind of devaluation of the French language in the course of the 20th century history, which led to a kind of situation where some of this bilingualism is at least not performed publicly anymore with a lot of pride. Let's put it mildly like this. The glagolitic language, I was thinking the glago glagolitic was a way of writing and not a language, but I'm, I'm not a historical linguist and I'm not trying to become one, so I think I better do not start um, debating this question. Sorry. Yeah, thanks also for your uh, very interesting lecture. I had a question about the, if I understood correctly, the, the Orthodox Church, there's a specific Ukrainian Orthodox Church that was able to regain its status after uh, independence as well. How did they deal with the language issue? Did they also encourage Ukrainian or in what language is used by the Ukrainian Orthodox Church? And I also had a small question about the Armenian language. In the figures that you showed, I was surprised to see that despite being a very small community, they do have a relatively strong linguistic presence. So what's the story behind that? I again start with the second part, as it's easier to say. I mean, historically, the Armenians have been a very important part of the urban population and also in some parts of the rural population, um, which has to do obviously with the conflicts that the Armenians um, experienced in the Ottoman Empire and the Russian Empire and took them as uh, refugees. Um, there's a strong kind of trader community and it's very old historically. So in Lviv, in Western Ukraine, uh, there are Armenian communities known since the 15th century, I think. So they're quite ancient and quite sort of, I mean, they have a relatively high status. And in other parts of the Caucasus, which is not Ukrainian, but also uh, the Black Sea shores, the Armenians were um, um, accepted by the Russian Empire as specialists for certain kinds of crops that were typically, typ typical for, for Russian or Ukrainian peasants. Think of tabak growing, for example. So there's also a, a rural community. And the, the Armenians actually, they are quite influential, which is not to say that they don't use Russian or that they don't intermarry, right? So this, I don't know whether it's broadly known, but uh, Sergei Lavrov, the Russian foreign minister is half Armenian, right? By his uh, descent. Anyway, so um, back to the other question, which, which is more tricky and perhaps more interesting is the link between uh, religion and language, right? And actually, we have to say that at least we have three Orthodox churches nowadays in Ukraine. Um, and um, that's why, why I emphasize um, the, the new language law was passed um, when Poroshenko was trying to regain elections. And at the same time, he was, um, in, or he was negotiating with the Patriarch in Constantinople, the separation of the Un Ukrainian church and its uh, acceptance by the economic um, patriarch in um, in Constantinople successfully, right? So the, what used to be the Russian Orthodox Church on Ukrainian territory <coughs> is nowadays split, but um, some of the really central church installations on the territory of Ukraine are still under, if I may say so, the command of Moscow, like, for example, the cave monastery is still uh, recognizing the patriarch uh, in Moscow. Um, but there is, a, there, there is a third Orthodox church, the so-called Greek Catholic Church, and its history goes back to the end of the 16th century, 1596, um, when on the Polish overlordship, um, the Orthodox in the, the Polish realm were more or less forced to recognize um, the superiority of the Pope in Rome. As a deal, they could, rem uh, or could keep the Orthodox liturgy, 
So it's a kind of mix back. And actually, when we go into the 19th century and these kind of first tensions, um, nationalist tensions in Ukraine, <clears throat> then you can see that the Russian Empire, as far as there were un uniate churches on its territory, it tried to suppress them roughly in the same time. So 1839, 1840, the last bishoprics were suppressed. But they got them sort of back in, obviously, with the ter territorial expansion uh, after the First World War and particularly after the Second World War. So we have now three Orthodox churches. And um, it's, it's not so that, let's say, the, the, the Ukrainian new um, Orthodox Church and the Greek Union Church are big friends with each other, right? There's quite some competition. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Uh, we have one comment online from our linguistic expert, Alex okay. Trace Francis. Oh, yeah. Indeed, Alex. confirms that Lagolita is a script. Um, but we also have a very interesting question about uh, public shaming of individuals who speak Russian in public. Yeah. It's more of a question about the future, I assume. Do you think this, those kinds of instances will take place after this conflict is finished? Okay, we're in the midst of an information war, right? Sort of, and Russian media, actually, there was a story, I don't know whether some of you have, might have read it in the NSA, right? Sort of, that people were sort of um, asked here by the NSA, Russians, about what had happened to them and what they would fear what would happen. And uh, obviously, Russian media sort of penned but shortened these answers in a way that it looked like as if um, Russian speakers are threatened in this country already. So I'm, I'm, I'm very sort of cautious in kind of um, saying this is like this or it's not. What I know, for example, from the experience of my wife, who's a Russian school teacher in Germany, she's not a Russian, but she's teaching Russian. Right, she's German. But um, there, sort of in her school, there are obviously um, a lot of second, third generation Russian Germans, as they are called, which is also a funny term. And now there are a lot of children coming um, from refugees, so they open up Ukrainian classes. And they were very much fearing that that might create problems. It's, it's I do think, um, with reference to this project, um, a, a question of handling. And if you sort of explain the situation, then many Ukrainian kids will be happy to have sort of peers that they can perhaps communicate easier with than people that just know English or German. Although we also know that a lot of kids have been traumatized by the war and simply want to be left alone. So I'm, I'm not going to be a big prophet, but what I said in the talk and what I, what, what I expect is that sort of this politicization of the languages will take its toll. How quickly that will go and how sort of, how much that will sideline Russian or perhaps lead to um, something else, which we observe in other parts of the world where the Russian language is less under the influence of Moscow. Think of Israel or other states with larger Russian speaking communities. They're perhaps the Russian language will develop independently and into other directions than the metropolitan language in Moscow. Although so far, uh, the Russian language has been character characterized by a large degree of centralization and adherence to norms. We have another interesting question from a person online. And if, if any of you still have questions here, please raise your hand and we'll take it after this one. But, um, the question online is about the, uh, the, the, the law of 2019 and about the claims that Russia has been making perennially about this law being discriminatory. Um, what would you say to, to those comments? Yeah, so <laughs> Russia has claimed that this law was discriminating Russian speakers long before it was passed. I mean, sort of. As I said, they, they were claiming that actually the, uh, the, 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 the actual repeal of the um, pro-Russian law had happened in 2014, which is not true. If you look at this law, actually it is much less favorable to Russian speakers and so have been the recent laws on education, as I said, and uh, that shouldn't be um, at all surprising. So that Russia takes up this element is clear, but if you look at the sort of more theor theoretical debates about language legislation, then you see that there is, um, like many other 
um, rearms a kind of tension between minority rights, which mean that you, you are protected in the use of your language. And usually that implies um, that you and your kin um, enjoy um, these language rights, but there's much less theory of majority languages because it's taken for granted that they are a majority and don't need shelter. But there are indeed sort of um, on the verge between linguistic politics and, and, and international law, there are considerations of whether um, a state has the right to enforce a certain language regime to preserve its integrity. This is the other pole, right, between um, which usually, obviously, a good language policy would look for compromises. Now, if Russia claims that the, 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 the Ukrainians are increasingly uncompromising, they have a point, but they have a point that they help to create. That would be my take on that. Do we have any more questions from the room? Do you, do you, see, do you want to see that Odessa become a Ukrainian? Will Odessa become a Ukrainian? I mean, this is a stupid question, but... Can you sort of repeat? Odessa. 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 Okay, yeah. I mean, sort of, it is much more Ukrainian than it um, has been before, right? Sort of, again, sort of, do not forget that, I mean, some Ukraine, and here, the, this, this aspect, and that's why I mentioned it, which I wouldn't have had normally in a history of, of the language, right? Sort of, Ukraine has been a battleground for several times, and that had a large impact on um, the linguistic regimes, sort of. There was a different type of bilingualism historically in, in Odessa between Russian and Yiddish, which is, has disappeared, right? And in the, in the, in the post-war period, a lot more Ukrainians moved into the city than have been living there before. Partly, obviously, in the Soviet period, they would have linguistically adapted to a kind of Russian majority language situation, which does, again, sort of, I mean, sort of, this is where the beauty and the difficulty of these border regions always lies because the practice is very often not captured in these uh, categorical takes on is this now a Russian language or a Ukrainian language city? No, probably both. And probably it's rather the Ukrainians who know both languages. This is something we can say more or less for sure. So in that sense, yes. And um, they all speak Russian. And one of my friends said something, his name is Yari Kravitz, so he's Jewish, 100% Jewish, Ukrainian. And he said, you know, fuck Russia. Russia is my language too. I grew up speaking Russian. It doesn't belong to Russia, it belongs to me. Yeah, uh, this is what I sort of alluded to in my last uh, answer as well, right? So thinkable is that there is a going, going to be a Ukrainian Russian language, which is increasingly, increasingly independent of the kind of norm setting uh, that Moscow attempts. Um, it's, I mean, sort of obviously the, the conditions for its development are not improved by the current wars and aggressions from the Russian side. I would rather expect that to, to be happening as well. We see it already in the Baltics or in Finland, where sort of uh, Russian speakers use a very funny mix of some Estonian terms and uh, some gram grammatical influences are already palpable. There's research in that. Why not in Ukraine? I mean, sort of should stop now, we're five minutes over. But um, if one wants to look at um, a kind of comparable case, one should look at Belarus. And the complicated linguistic uh, identity questions that play out there. And um, before he obviously became totally dependent of Putin again, due to the suppression of the democracy uh, movement in his own country, even Lukashenko was kind of walking on eggshells and declaring that his preference for Russian against nationalist Belarusian was among other things to do with that actually it was the Belarusians who invented the Russian language and developed it and so on and so forth, right? So, I mean, rhetorically, you can do all kinds of vaults in order to explain that, but sort of um, Russia, a Russian has become a global language in a different meaning than it had been under communist times. Under communist times, the communists could sort of um, impress the UN and say, okay, this is one of the UN languages, so it's a world language. But now actually Russian speakers have spread across um, the globe. None of them, or not, not all of them are ethnic Russians, many of them are not. And still they use Russian and they make it perhaps as you say, or as you quoted your friend, 
it's my own property and I do what I want with it. We are indeed five minutes over time, but if I could squeeze in uh, two more questions. Um, one very quick question from the chat and one question from me. Um, the question from the chat is about um, whether you foresee uh, the script being ever Latinized. Um, and I would perhaps turn this question around and do you know of any past discussions about that, whether there were any proposals in the past to Latinize the script in Ukrainian? And the second question from me is more about the future of the academic debate uh, on the language question in Ukraine. Um, do you see this question ever going beyond this binary of Russian and Ukrainian and perhaps other languages such as Ruthenian or Tatar being included in this mainstream academic but also public debate on language use in Ukraine? Wow, okay. <laughs> um, the first question was... Oh, the script. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, the alphabet. Yes, um, I've, I've, I've been seeing texts from the mid 19th century in the preparation of the big Slavic Congress in Prague, 1848, when people from Ukraine were writing to their Polish or uh, Czech peers in what seemed to be uh, Ukrainian written in Latin characters, obviously to make the readability for their peers uh, on the basis of the common knowledge of the Slavic language. Uh, feasible. But due to the kind of link, and, and Ukraine is part of the Orthodox world, right? Sort of, um, I mean, Romania changed the, the, the script. I do not expect the Ukrainians to do that. I do think that there's rather a kind of attempt, and perhaps more successfully than so far, like in Kazakhstan, to introduce English as a kind of more common, kind of second international language than rather sort of. Um, because it's a national symbol as well, the, the script, right? I do not expect that to happen. That's one. And the other question was, your question was about uh, the, the, the academic debate. And public debates and the binary nature of that debate. Yeah, but if you look at, I mean, if you look at numbers, I mean, we, we, they are absolutely dominant. And <clears throat> I'm sometimes <clears throat> um, surprised how much influence for example, the questions of the Hungarian or Romanian language used in Ukraine have, although the numbers are not very high, but these are cl clearly also questions that are <coughs> kept alive from the outside. The, the Crimean Tatars, that's a different story. And particularly after the loss of Crimea, <coughs> Ukraine has portrayed itself as a safe haven for the Crimean Tatars. And many Crimean Tatars intellectuals accepted that. But still, the Crimeans want to live on the Crimea. And whether they throw in their lots now with Ukraine is a different story. So I would think sort of, I mean, perhaps the same answer is true. I think sort of the rise of English will complement the language situation rather than, let's say, Tatar or any other local language. Okay. Thank you very much for all your questions. Thank you so much, Christian, for this excellent talk and excellent discussion. Thank you. We hope to see you all next week. Um, it's uh, the, the next week's lecture will be about Ukraine in World War II. It will also be in person. It's by uh, Karel Verkov of, of NIOS, our local institution. So hopefully see you then and thank you.